Now, let's get to what happened last night in the House of Commons, the House of Lords, I should say. The government's flagship Rwanda bill uh, was debated in the House of Lords last night and uh, passed uh, as was expected, despite opposition from former Tory Chancellor Ken Clark and, of course, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Well, joining me right now is former Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party. That's Lord Lilly. Uh, good morning to you, Lord Lilly. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, you, I know you were in the debate, you voted with the government, but were you surprised by some of the grandees like Ken Clark coming out and speaking against this safety of Rwanda bill? Not entirely, uh, although previously Ken Clark spoke in favour of the principle of the Rwanda arrangement. Indeed, he repeated that uh, last night, though he said he thought the reason he didn't support this bill is that it states, as a matter of fact, that Rwanda is safe. Uh, and that was the main line of those who were opposed to it. They were saying you can't legislate as to whether uh, that fact is the case. That should be left to the courts to decide. I take a slightly different view, but I understand their view. Well, indeed, I mean... <laughs> The thing is, we knew that this is what was going to happen uh, in the House. We knew it would get through the first vote. We, uh, and we know that it was going to go to the committee stage where numerous numbers of, uh, of uh, amendments are going to be tagged on and, and changes made. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury said he wouldn't vote against this measure. Labour, we know, abstained because he wants there to be um, some sort of amendments to the bill. Let's have a little watch and a listen of what Archbishop uh, of Canterbury, just as well, but had to say about the bill where he was sort of doing a lot of the usual will be hand-wringing. We can, as a nation, do better than this bill. With this bill, the government is continuing to seek good objectives in the wrong way, leading the nation down a damaging path. It is damaging for asylum seekers in need of protection and safe and legal routes to be heard. I mean, how damaging is this? I mean, the idea this is damaging when this is something which a lot of European countries are looking at, you know, even the nice ones like Germany and Sweden, you know, they're looking <laughs> at some changes in legislation because of this, the, the fact that we are living in a situation where the millions of people who are trying to get to Europe, and indeed, as we're seeing in America as well, major election issue there, that this is overwhelming a system that was not designed for this, was designed back in the 1940s and 50s for, for a completely different issue. Well, uh, what we're saying to people, if this bill goes through and the system's up and running, is that anybody in France or, Germany, or in the European Union who wants to come to the UK will know that they'll instead be sent to Rwanda. So they might just as well stay in the European Union if they don't like the idea of going to Rwanda. That doesn't seem to me an unchristian option to bribe people. Uh, and the reason I'm happy to say that Rwanda should be considered safe is it's safe enough that the risks of people being deported further from Rwanda back to their home country, though not zero, are pretty small, whereas the risks of dying if they are tempted to take the risk of crossing the channel are large enough to be frightening. And if it's right, and the Archbishop accepts that it's right to try and stop people coming across physically by patrolling the French border, why is it wrong to stop people coming across by saying uh, we're going to deter you from coming? Why is prevention OK, but deterrence wrong? I don't understand that. I've got a lot of time and respect for the Archbishop of Canterbury. I think he is actually a very good man, but he's got his knickers in a twist on this issue. No, I mean, I'm sure he's a very, very good man, but it's, again, it's easy for these people to say, oh, well, I'm good, I'm a lovely person. I'm, you know, uh, you know, I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury, for goodness sake. But he doesn't live with the consequences. He doesn't have children competing for housing or for school places. He's not competing for a job. He's not living in a street with, you know, whole, whole, whole households of, uh, of, of, of migrants. I'm, I'm sorry, he's just not living in the real world like the rest of us. Uh, and that's the issue. I think like a lot of the politicians making these decisions. Were you surprised by what Ken Clark had to say? Lord Clark, not just a former chancellor, of course, former Home Secretary, uh, he didn't back the bill. He, he, uh, he said it was a step too far that risked pushing the UK towards an elected dictatorship. We seem to have got into this strange situation in this country where an awful lot of MPs and peers, even on the Tory side, are, seem to be under the view that the, the, the law was set some years back and is now completely immutable and cannot be changed, even though laws are meant to be enforced by courts, but made by elected politicians. 
Yes, that is true. Uh, Ken Clark is, of course, a lawyer, and all lawyers go through this defamation pro process <laughs> where their brains are addled to thinking that lawyers are right and everybody else is wrong, <laughs> and that lawyers should not merely be allowed to interpret and apply the law, but make it. Indeed, there were some dangerous passages in Ken Clark's speech where he did apply, uh, imply that uh, the court should be able to rule laws unconstitutional, which is just simply not our way. The Supreme Court of this country is the Supreme Court of Parliament. It is Parliament who decides ultimately what the law is. Uh, it used to be said in the 18th century that Parliament could make any law it liked except to make a man a, 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 into a woman. And now it's even found it can do that. <laughs> Absolutely nailed it. Can I move on to uh, events that have been happening uh, even later uh, than that uh, vote in the House of Lords, which came late, and that was in the early hours of this morning, the DUP, normally having late-night talks with other parties, or the British government had late-night talks with itself, uh, and where its executive agreed that they would return to power-sharing at Stormont. It's, uh, we've had no, uh, basically, devolved government in Northern Ireland for the best part of two years as a result of the DUP walking out. They'd be entitled to, uh, to be uh, uh, the, the, the deputy Deputy First Minister, wouldn't they, uh, against the Sinn Féin's First Minister? Um, do you welcome this move? And what is being what is being on offer from the British government um, that is enticing them back into power sharing? Well, I'm very concerned about this. First of all, about the process. The DUP executive were asked to sign up to something without seeing the text. It hasn't been released. What actually they signed up to? That's quite extraordinary. It's a bit like the sort of bounce that was done with the original Windsor Framing framework, where we were all asked to agree with it before we'd actually seen it. I was invited by the Prime Minister, others were, who had uh, concerns about the issue, and asked to sign up something without seeing it. And you only do that if you've got something to hide. So I want to know what the government is trying to hide from the DUP uh, to sort of bounce them into it. So that's my first concern. Maybe it's all going to be... Uh, plain and lovely when it is public. But, but surely, surely when My they second... see it, if they don't like it, then they'll refuse to join the power-sharing deal. Well, maybe, maybe. Uh, though clearly the executive of the DUP had decided they wanted to go along with it. And that brings me to the second point. I understand why the DUP have uh, signed up to this. Uh, and that is they've been put in under great pressure, probably improper pressure, by threats to withhold, indeed they are withholding money from... Northern Ireland, which uh, means effectively people in the public sector are not getting paid uh, and not likely to get paid pay increases equal to those of their counterparts in the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, that's a kind of bullying which I don't like to see. So that's my second concern. But my third concern is more substantive, that there appears to be something in this agreement which has been sold to the DUP as saying this will make it much more difficult for Great Britain ever to diverge from the rules of the laws of the European Union, which apply in Northern Ireland. Uh, and therefore, we will be trapped in some way into obeying the rules of the uh, European Union within the whole of the United Kingdom. And they're saying this is because they'll, any law will have to pass the uh, non-divergence test. There'll have to be a statement from a minister that this law will not make yeah. the law of the Great Britain diverge from that of Northern Ireland. Indeed. Thank you. And uh, they're saying to the Northern Irish, that's serious. They're saying to the rest of us yeah. privately, oh, it's yeah. only a statement, it doesn't matter, you could ignore yeah. it once you've made it. It's yeah. either one or the other. It's either going to be an inhibition on us taking advantage of the opportunities of Brexit, or it's not. Yeah. And we need to know which it is. And I fear it is going to be something that the blob has always wanted, the civil service has always wanted, just to freeze us with the, the laws we inherited from Europe rather than taking opportunity of introducing laws which are our, in our own interests and will make Lord us Libby. more prosperous. Well, I have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciate that former Deputy of the Conservative Party, Tory Peer, of course. Uh, thank you. Uh,